Segment three, Big Bang. The Devil's Delusion again. Scientists, the Big Bang and the Anthropic Principle, by the way, we'll cover both if we, if we may. Sure. The, devil, the Devil's Delusion, scientists, the physicist Paul Davies has observed, are slowly waking up to an inconvenient truth. The universe looks suspiciously like a fix. The issue concerns the very laws of nature themselves, close quote. Explain that, if you would. Well, Paul Davies is one of a number of physicists, certainly not the only one. Fred Hoyle, who was a, a very serious 20th century astrophysicist, came to the same conclusion. He said the universe looks like it's been monkeyed with by a super intellect. Uh, things are so precisely coordinated, num numerical values for certain parameters are so finely adjusted, and if they were perturbed in any way, things would collapse or the universe would become chaotic or living systems couldn't arise, that we cannot conclude that this was all the result of any kind of accidental process. It's inherent in the design. But when we look at the laws of nature, nothing in the laws of nature suggests it must be this way. The design is inherent in the numerical parameters, and certain properties we see in the universe, but we have no good account for this. The laws of nature are silent. They are what they are. They can work with any uh, numerical, within any numerical valuation or range. So all of these guys, and there's Fred Hoyle, there's Paul Davies, um, Stephen Hawking once was talking about mm -hmm. this. Any thoughtful physicist will say, why is the universe the way it is? Why is the universe the way it is? Precisely the way it is when what we might expect rationally is a generic universe. Generic is a term of mathematics meaning what you would ordinarily expect, the most likely kind of case. And we're very far from generosity in the universe. We're a highly unlikely kind of structure we inhabit. And the question is, why is that? Now, one answer to Fred Hoyle is that the universe looks as if it were monkeyed by us monkeyed with by a super intellect is, it was monkeyed with by a super intellect. Things were set up just so. Another answer is, we really don't know. It's one of the enigmas of modern science. A third answer is, there are many, many, many thousands, millions of other universes, and what is unlikely in this one may be likely when we consider all of them. So how much I'm trying to, the anthropic principle, the suggestion is, your suggestion is that it's reasonable to suppose that it was set up. That is to say, the laws of the universe are consistent with the notion of the Judeo-Christian idea of a creator who set it up. Uh, I think John Paul II said that man is the only creature that God willed for his own sake. So that if the, if the belief is that this is all set up to produce human beings, that's consistent with what we see in the anthropology. Completely. Anthropic. Okay. But you're not saying, you're saying only that it's consistent. You're not taking it a step further to argue that it is evidence or even suggestive that there may be a creator because after all, again, the crude layman's attempt to grasp the argument here, you spin the roulette wheel and the ball falls on number seven, and you could spend the rest of your life saying, with all those possible s slots, why did it fall on number seven? Why should that have been? Well, it was because it was. It was an yeah. accident, right? So, so you can't really get very far. You can't construct much of a proof of the existence of a no. creator. You can't. No, you can't. But you can construct an argument, something short of a proof. All right. I agree if the ball drops in the slot mark number seven just once, you can say, well, and you get a big payoff. It's interesting, drop ones. If it drops in number seven, again and again and again, at some point you would be entitled to scratch your head and say, you know, the game must be fixed or I must be inordinately favored to be winning it like this. But I'm not going to say I'm lucky. That right. doesn't seem to me a perfectly appropriate answer. At some point, luck runs out, as we all know. Right. All right. Uh, I, now we move to the Big Bang. Again, I quote the devil's delusion. The best data we have concerning the Big Bang, the Nobel laureate Arno Penzias remarked, are exactly what I would have predicted had I nothing to go on but the five books of Moses, the Psalms, the Bible as a whole. Close quote. That's a wonderful 
wonderful quotation. Now, this is one of, one of the, um, the two people who discovered the microwave background radiation for which he got a Nobel Prize. This is a serious guy. Yeah, he's a serious guy. And uh, he didn't know what he was discovering. He was very lucky. He struck pure gold. He thought he was examining pigeon droppings on his antenna. And he finally found a nose, a signal from the microwave background radiation. But he, like many other physicists, initially confronting the facts of the Big Bang. Which you'd better summarize for us. The Big Bang means that apparently the universe exploded into inexistence from nothingness around 14 or 15 million years ago, billion years ago. Uh, it's an occurrence for which we have no causal explanation. Now, there are plenty of theories about it. There are plenty of attempts to go back behind the Big Bang and see what was going on behind it. But right now, one of the uh, obdurate facts, one of the irremovable facts of cosmology is that 14 to 15 billion years ago, there was a universe, small, intensely hot, intensely compact, intensely curved, and before that, there was nothing. Not even space and time before that. And the point is that fiat lux, yes. let there be light, is as consistent with the data as any other explanation. It is precisely consistent with the data. It is a prediction, although not a quantitative prediction, that uh, astonished the community of physicists in the 1960s, astonished Einstein in the 1920s when he realized the field equations of general relativity predicted an expanding universe. And Einstein understood right away it was expanding. It's got to be expanding from something. And he rejected it. He didn't like the idea. He wanted a steady state universe lasting from all eternity, from one eternity to another eternity. But uh, the Hubble data persuaded him he was wrong. Okay, so again, we get, with the anthropic principle, it's not a proof. No. But it sure is suggestive. That's your argument. And the Big Bang, it's not a proof. It could be simply because it could be. But it is, I guess what I'm trying to do is to get you to distinguish between your judgment in these matters, between um, saying it's merely consistent with the Judeo-Christian view of a creator who brought it all into being, or you'd like to suggest that it points in that direction. There's something positively suggestive about it. It's certainly uh, moving and disturbing that in the 20th century, cosmology should have rejected an ancient view of the universe as moving from the everlasting to the everlasting with no origin and embraced a completely different view, but one that is in no way new. It's part of the religious tradition. I think I would like to, to, to rest my commitment by saying this is strange, unexpected, moving, and very curious. Uh, certainly, certainly, someone who objects as indignantly as I do to claims of having discovered a proof made by the likes of Dawkins or Sam Harris or the other scientists arguing in this realm with respect to the existence of God, I'm, I'm not about to say I've discovered a proof to the contrary. The language of proofs is appropriate to mathematics, not to a discussion like this. What is appropriate to a discussion like this is philosophical argumentation. And we cannot close the day by saying one side is definitively in possession of an argument so fine, so fecund, so powerful that it ends all discussion. They won't end. The discussions won't end. But a little a bit of balance would be welcome.